Thank you for joining us for another episode of Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement. I am here at the News Forum where all voices matter. Well, let's welcome to Boom and Bust another guest to discuss the state of Atlantic Canada post Fiona tropical storm. There's a lot to talk about. So with us today is Jake Stewart. He is the MP for Miramichi Grand Lake in the province of New Brunswick. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Tony. It's, it's a pleasure to be on your program. I've heard a lot about it. Well, it's great to have uh, great guests from all over the country and the world, including yourself. Uh, you've just been appointed uh, as uh, the critic or the shadow minister for the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency. So congratulations to that. Just sort of hot off the presses while we're taping. Uh, maybe give our viewers from outside Atlantic Canada just a little bit of knowledge of what ACOA is and why that's an important agency for Atlantic Canada. ACOA is one of the most, the most <clears throat> foremost important agency in Atlantic Canada. A lot of our major projects, they search for funding, federal dollars in particular, through the Atlantic Opportunities Agency. Um, very honored to take on this role. I have had a, um, a phone call from the, the minister, Ms. Uh, Petipa Taylor. So I'm going to have a call with her either today or tomorrow. I'm really excited about it because in Atlantic Canada, it's, it's our number one, uh, basically our number one place that we find federal dollars for infrastructure or regional development projects. So I'm really excited to get to work on that. And I'm very honored that our leader, Pierre Pauly, have asked me to uh, do this position on his behalf. Well, congratulations to that. Again, I think we will be talking about the, some of the infrastructure needs of Atlantic Canada a bit later in the broadcast. But I would love to get from you uh, uh, your uh, views on the state of things uh, in New Brunswick, in Atlantic Canada, generally post uh, Fiona, but maybe more generally. Can you give us a little bit of a sense of how things are going there? Sure. I'd spoken to um, Premier Higgs a few times from the beginning, as well as Premier Houston. I know that um, in New Brunswick, we didn't get hit as hard as Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia, and of course, Newfoundland, areas like Port of Basque. We've seen some of the severity the storm caused in those areas. In my home province, we had some, uh, obviously we had some power lines that were down. We had um, the area around Shediac got hit particularly hard. And in my own constituency, the Escumanac Wharf was, I mean, they've been waiting seven years for a project. And now, now this project is intensified because there's probably anywhere from five to $10 million worth of extensive damage from the storm. And these are, these are, I mean, all over the Atlantic provinces, the blue economy is such a mainstay, it's such a proficient piece of the economic pie, not only in the country, but it's number one or two in Atlantic Canada. So the government of Canada is going to have to have, going to have to really put in a major effort to repair all of these small craft harbors and these wharfs, because we depend on this, these fish for, for food, we ship them on the open market. We, we export them to other provinces, other jurisdictions. It's a huge piece of the economic pie in Atlantic Canada. So I'm going to be watching very closely how the government uh, is managing this file. I, I did speak to some of my colleagues in Nova Scotia. I know they had some great struggles with power. And I, I mean, in New Brunswick, we were, we've were we had you know Hurricane Arthur. We've had a couple of different storms, some ice storms in recent years that I seen what it's like to lose power for a number of days, but people in Nova Scotia lost power for a couple of weeks. And it's uh, devastating when that happens, devastating for the, for the people there. But like I say, I've been working with my colleagues and speaking to some of the premiers on occasion and just trying to be uh, helpful in any way that I can as a member of parliament. Yeah, I just, uh, I just want to return to something you, you just said. So one uh, war for harbor uh, out of many that need to be fixed, that just for that one harbor that you mentioned, I think it was Shediac or somewhere around there. Uh, Escumanac. Uh, sorry, yes. So five to ten million dollars just for that one harbor. Yeah, that harbor. You would you would have worked with um, my predecessor, former MP Tilly O'Neill Gordon. So the O'Neills are are a very um, one of the leading families in, in the fishing industry in Escumanac, and that's where Tilly's from. And um, in, in, in this area, the Escumanac Wharf, they had severe damage. I actually, I, I'd gone down there about a week or two before the storm because there's a project that's seven years in the planning and design stage. They're way behind. It probably would have been a two to four million dollar problem if they'd solved it 
you know, six or seven years ago. So now it's intensified. So now I went down after the storm. Some of the boys on the wharf committee put me on a lobster boat and they, and they actually Hold on to that me story. On. Hold on to that story about the lobster boat. Welcome back to Boom and Bust. Uh, I'm your host, Tony Clement, here with Jake Stewart. He is the member of parliament for Miramichi Grand Lake. Jake, we had you, when we went to commercial, we had you on the lobster boat. So please continue with that story, what you what you found out. Well, as I was saying, the Escumanac Wharf Committee had invited me down as their member of parliament because they were supposed to get funding this year for the final planning and development and design stage of what would have been probably a two to four million dollar project, give or take. Um, six or seven years later, of course, with inflation, everything's intensified, the price is greater. Then fast forward, the storm happens. Then I get called to go back down. So I'm down there, Tony, and they put me on a lobster boat and I'm, I'm assessing the damage. I can't believe what I'm looking at. It looks unsafe. It looks like the damages now are gonna be anywhere from 10 million to 15. I, I could be more. This is just one more where serious economic development occurs every year that basically is the driving force behind Bay St. Anne and Escumanac, Hardwick region with Bay de Vin and all the fishermen that come out of this region. And I, I think the government has really, I, I was already critical of what they were doing with small craft harbors. Right. But after the storm, they have some very serious decisions to make and they have to make them now. They're not going to be made next June and ruin another fishing season. Like they really have got to, they have no choice. They really have to fix these wars now because we, we have so much economic development that's been from the fishing community. Uh, right. And let's, let's talk about that a little bit, the interaction with the federal government. Obviously, you're calling for uh, some extraordinary measures from the federal government. I'm sure the premiers have been doing the same thing. What, what's, what's the dialogue like right now? Well, the dialogue is um, early last week, the government put out a 300 and some odd dollar, uh, million dollar package for COA. And I looked at some of the parameters since then. I haven't checked this morning. I'm, I'm hoping there's like a formal application process at this point. There wasn't when I was in Eskimanac on, on Saturday morning of Thanksgiving weekend. I went down early in the morning. I flew home Friday. And I drove to a scuba next Saturday morning, get on the boat, assess the damage. But I'm assuming, but what I'm learning is that the damages could be in the 1.3 to $4 billion range. And the government has a $300 million package. You and I both know that's not going to go very far. No. When you're talking about every wharf that got destroyed alone, just in Atlantic Canada from the storm. So just, just to get the lobster and, and crab and all the main fisheries back up and running off of these wharfs is going to cost serious dollars. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm going to be meeting with the minister, as I said, uh, Ms. Taylor, Pettipa Taylor. I'm going to find out what the formal application process looks like. And then I'm going to get back to my, my wharf committee to let them know how to, how to apply. Cause they, they didn't know how to apply on Saturday morning. Right. And it did seem, it did seem unclear still at that moment. I'm guessing it's solved now, but I'm going to look later on today. So. And and to be clear, uh, without the uh, uh, all the work that to be done to restore these wharves and uh, the infrastructure at these harbors, you really can't do the fishing uh, because it'll be unsafe for the uh, fishers, right? It's going to be very unsafe. I couldn't believe some of the damage that I assessed in Skumanac. And from my understanding, some of the wharves in Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia are every bit is bad or worse. So, I mean, I'm only looking at one and it's in my riding. It's in the Northeastern part of, of, uh, of New Brunswick and it's right on the Bay. They obviously it got hit by considerable size waves, but the entire Prince Edward Island has a lot of these worse and it got hit all over the Island and a big piece of Nova Scotian shore got hit. So I'm sure I'm only looking at, even though it's a big deal to me and my constituency and it's number one priority for me, at home, my MPs are looking at this all over Atlantic Canada. So this is this is a this is a big deal for the government, and it, and it is going to require them to spend some money. Um, and this is the type of situation where at least it warrants it. You know, we you have to 
the fishing industry is so big. Like I said earlier, the blue economy in our country is is paramount. It's paramount in Atlantic Canada. It's paramount in British Columbia. It's paramount in our country. So we have to we have to ensure that our fishermen can get out there and get that catch, make their livelihood, export the product, feed local families, put it on the market. This, these things we need this to continue uh, across our country. So this is a big project for the government. And to me, they the answers are simple. But uh, I'm going to be paying very close attention now in my role as a COA shadow minister. Uh, we're talking with Jake Stewart. He is the member of parliament for Miramichi Grand Lake, New Brunswick. We'll be right back after these messages. Please stay with us. Jake, I'd uh, love to get a sense from you from uh, your interactions with your constituents, uh, other people in your province and, and throughout the region. What is, what, how is the cost of living crisis playing out in your neck of the woods? Well, Tony, I mean, where I live in, in Atlantic Canada, in rural New Brunswick, Miramichi Grand Lake, people are burning oil and uh, they still have wood, wood heat, oil furnace heat. Um, we don't have the luxury of natural gas lines to hook up to. Um, and largely, largely because we're very rural. But in Atlantic Canada and in, in Miramichi Grand Lake, people are struggling because the, the average income for a family here is $34,000. And you take, you take the cost of fuel, cost of home heating, cost of groceries, cost of rent. Everything, everything in our country is going up with inflation. The government continues to print money while they blame it on a global phenomenon. But essentially, we've always had some inflation, somewhere from 1% or 2% over the decades, over the years. You're seeing inflation of 7 and 8% and more and greater with, with no sign of it slowing. And I think in, in places like in New Brunswick, where the economy in New Brunswick is always it's always a struggle. We, we, can, we never wake up in the morning and say our economy is through the roof in New Brunswick. I've never heard that. Now I'm 44 years old. There might have been a day when we could have said that. We had a very booming forestry industry. We have many decades of prosperity just with forestry alone. Hmm. But times have changed. And the government is trying to convince people in rural New Brunswick to drive electric cars. We don't even have a lot of places to plug them in. You know, like I'm serious when I say this. It's taking... You order electric car, it takes 18 months to get here. And then when it gets here, it's half broken because the lithium's controlled in China and we're not managing that properly. Then they have nowhere to plug the car in once they get it. So the government of Canada is so out of touch with rural Canada that quite frankly, it, it will shock me if they even remotely do well in the polls next election in Atlantic Canada. They're so out of touch with rural Canada that it's hard to even put into words. And, and these costs are crippling families. It's putting young people out of the prospect of buying a home. Some of them are living with their parents, um, you know, and with no hope, no hope in sight. Red tape and, and, and bureaucracy and, and municipal gatekeeping in the way of housing development. It's, it's tough to watch. And, and as the MP here, I, I'm forever trying to speak the language of the rural Canadian, because I am one, I understand the struggle, and and it's my job to to speak the language of of the rural Canadians that I represent here. And uh, are you getting a sense that I mean, this sounds like very common throughout the country? If we were having a conversation with a rural British Columbian or a Manitoban or an Ontarian, same same kind of things. Uh, are, are you getting that sense as well? I get the sense from my colleagues in caucus that it's it's all over Canada. Like it, even like even the urban areas. Like you live in an urban area, you got you know you got a pretty decent economy. You've got great internet, great options for fiber cables and mobility. You, there's a lot of benefits to living in an urban area, but the cost, <laughs> the cost in Toronto and Vancouver, is, is gone through the roof. You know, and and people in urban areas. There's always been some great perks to live in urban Canada, 
but now the cost is through the roof. And so if, if a rural Canadian, if we're struggling with the cost, we don't have the same level of service. We don't have the same internet capability. We don't have the same specs that you would get in an urban part of the country, but our costs, the different, the thing that's the same is both areas cost is going up in both areas, whether it's urban or rural. And I think that, I think the Trudeau government, where they're getting it wrong is that they continue to print money, but then they don't believe they're a part of the problem. And I, I mean, I'm not a, a leading Canadian economist. Okay. I'm an, I'm a member of parliament, you know, but I can tell you right now, if Trudeau wasn't prime minister, and if he hadn't been prime minister for the last three or four years, do I think inflation would be the same number as it is today? I don't. I believe that a better fiscal manager of the country, we would have a lower rate of inflation. I still think it would have been tough through COVID right. and some of the things we've experienced. But I think that that he's printing it too much. Right, and I right. think that's contributing to the problem we have. Indeed. Uh, Jake, we're going to have to take another brief break. We'll be right back after these messages with our guest, uh, MP Jake Stewart. And welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, here with Member of Parliament Jake Stewart. He represents the community of Miramichi Grand Lake in the province of New Brunswick. Jake, I'd love to get a sense from... Uh, you travel all around your communities, of course, and your province and throughout the region. Uh, there, there, there's got to be some really interesting good things happening, maybe some innovations that are occurring uh, that, in your neck of the woods. Any, any good stories about people succeeding with new businesses and uh, with new innovations? Uh, there was a couple of really positive um, housing developments in Miramichi Grand Lake. I did hear that they got bogged down in some some planning and some red tape, but the finished product is a very nice building. So one of the things I, I had, I met with the multicultural um, association today in Mamashi and, and, you know, they were expressing that there are, there are so many that want to come to this country that want to come to Mamashi, mm -hmm. but we just need more housing. So one of the, one of the things that I'm hoping that we can improve over the next couple of years is the number of units we build. I know there's some, there's some positive developments already in Miramichi, but we, we still need a lot more. Um, looking through, there's there's a couple of really good projects, like the Miramichi uh, Northern Bypass project is a really good project locally. It's not started yet. That's one of the big ones that I'm kind of keeping an eye out for. But if I think if I think around the province, there's been a couple of big um, arenas and stuff built in certain areas. Hampton, Karakit, there's been a few places like that. I noticed that they're building like a few new hockey rinks and things like that. But you know, to speak of, I'm mostly mostly focused on projects that that have kind of fell to the wayside, like the Energy East Pipeline. Right. Natural gas deposits in New Brunswick, that the ones that are untapped. Um, we have so much potential in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and all through Atlantic with that Bay to Nord project. And, off the offshore of Newfoundland. These are some of the projects that I'm really keeping an eye on. Yeah, I've that's really interesting. The like the natural gas uh, projects, you, you talked about uh, be, people being connected to oil and coal, uh, that that would make a huge different, uh, difference in your community to tap those projects, right? It would. I mean, you, you mentioned like innovative projects that are happening in the province. And lately, I, I'm going to go on a little bit of a tour here in my new role and I'll get back to you because I'm going to hear yeah. about all the projects that maybe I haven't heard of yet, but I, I've been keeping track of of the the, the revenue generating and the um, energy and resource projects that that we have the opportunity we have in Atlantic Canada. We've got a great opportunity with peat moss. We've got the Energy East pipeline, which which could have brought oil from Alberta to ports in Saint John and Montreal, Saint John, New Brunswick, and Montreal. We also have natural gas deposits. We have iron ore potential, tungsten. We have so much potential in Atlantic Canada, and we we really need to start championing those ideas because we're watching as the situation unfolds in Russia. Putin is actually selling his energy to our Western allies. So right. he's getting to fuel the war machine by selling energy resources to our very own allies of England and France and Germany. And I think the climate agenda has really 
failed to look at energy sovereignty, energy security, national defense, and it failed to look at all the other aspects of the country that, that we have to think about as parliamentarians. And in New Brunswick, we have that great potential of energy and resources, and I think we should be exploiting that in a responsible manner. And I just wanted to say I'm kind of keeping track of those projects. We've got about 45 seconds left, but uh, talking to your constituents, uh, are they optimistic that uh, these things could make a big difference in their lives? My constituents knew that the Energy East Pipeline was a nation-building project. They still support it completely. Natural gas filed to get off the ground, but they know there's still a market for that. They, they know it's still, in, they know we're still standing on top of it. So, peat moss, we have a lot of potential in that. There's small developments, but we have such an abundance of it. Um, my constituents are on board. They want to see economic development in uh, Miramichi Grand Lake. In New Brunswick. Well, Jake Stewart, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. Once again, congratulations on your new role as a critic or shadow minister for the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency. That You're right, you're going to get lots of tours around the region uh, understanding uh, some of these new projects. We wish you well, sir. Thanks again. Thanks a lot, Tony. Thanks to our guest again, Member of Parliament Jake Stewart from Miramichi Grand Lake in the province of New, of New Brunswick, talking about some of the challenges uh, not only for New Brunswick, but for other Atlantic uh, Canada provinces and communities as well. Very interesting. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next time. <laughs>